On behalf of Pastor Phil and the family of Believer's Christian Church, we are excited to sow this message into your life. Our mission at Believer's is to love God, love people, and serve both. Our prayer is that through this message, you will receive revelation that will bring a lasting change into your life. To find out more about us, log on to BelieversChristianChurch.com. Good morning. Uh, everyone looks good today. I, uh, I bet you hear that all the time, right? I mean, look at you. <clears throat> Back is... Um, thank you. Thank you. We, uh, anyone, anyone here not know who Tiger Woods is? Tiger Woods plays golf, you know, he's like a phenom. When he does something really cool, y'all know what he does, right? He does like the fist pump, like the really, the really good one. Look at your neighbor and tell neighbor. Oh, hold on. That was weak. Y'all aren't participating. Look at your neighbor. Say neighbor. Thank you. If you don't get encouraged today, it's your own fault. Amen. So we are in a a series that we began last week, really just taking the momentum off from Resurrection Weekend, Easter Sunday, Easter Weekend, and uh, uh, hitting on the fact that too often, in fact, probably most often, we treat resurrection as a calendar event that happens once a year. We show up at church with our new shiny dresses and our new shiny ties, and you look real handsome and look real pretty. And then we, we kind of go back into the routine of Christianity. We kind of go back into the mundane, and then uh, it comes around next year, and we get excited again about the resurrection. But that is not the intention of the resurrection power that Jesus has afforded you and I. The resurrection power is something that abides within each one that believes on Jesus. We're we're not just to huddle up, make do with making heaven. Christianity was never intended to just be about making heaven. Jesus never went around preaching a message that was all about making heaven. He preached a message of the kingdom. And he wanted us to get the message that heaven needs to be with inside of us. The power of heaven needs to be with inside of us. And let's start manifesting, materializing this power that now we have, which we're calling the resurrection power. And so one of the, the things that I want to hit on three verses, or at least just to kind of recap a little bit from last week. In John 11, Jesus is called upon by Martha and Mary. Their brother is sick unto death. And you would think that under an emergency situation, Jesus would have, you know, responded just like that, but he didn't. He held out for a couple days and did some, some, uh, continued to do some ministry. Well, as a result, Lazarus dies. But when Jesus shows up, Martha runs out to meet him and she says, you know, Jesus, if you would have been here, Lazarus wouldn't have died. And he says, Lazarus is going to raise again. And Martha says, well, I know he'll be raised again in the last day. Again, in my mind's eye, I can almost see Jesus grimacing going, uh, that's not what I'm talking about at all. I am the resurrection and the life. He was about to demonstrate what that resurrection power looks like when he calls dead Lazarus out of the grave after he's in that tomb for four days. And so then we, re- we fast forward just a little bit to John 14, where Jesus now is talking to his disciples about this resurrection power. He says, guys, it's better for you that I go so that the helper comes, the Holy Spirit. And he's not only going to come and dwell upon you, he's going to dwell within you. This is significant because that never happened in Christian history up until the cross and and, uh, the resurrection of Jesus. People were going to a temple. The presence of God was residing within a building around the ark. And so that thought has permeated still within church culture. Christy was telling me a story that something that happened this week. Her and her daughter were at an appointment and a gentleman uh, had asked, do you mind if I pray for your daughter? Sure, go ahead. And he says, well, I mean, have you come to church with me where the presence of God is. Yeah, right? And th- that was a pastor. So we're not talking about it's just a, uh, uh, for an occasional thought. This is a, a pretty permeating thought within church culture that we come here because God is here. God is here because you're here and the presence of God is dwelling inside of you. That's a, that makes a big difference because now everywhere I go, I carry that power with me for the miraculous and for the to-do life. Now, let me just throw my disclaimer out there now so they don't have to come back and say it again. 
in and of myself, in and of yourself, there is nothing good and nothing powerful. But you are not in and of yourself if you're born again. If you have the Spirit of God dwelling within you, you carry this power. You have the operating power in you to do the miraculous. How do I know that? Jesus, on his final conversation before he would ascend, he's talking to the guys in Acts chapter 1, specifically in verse 8. He says, guys, go wait for the Holy Spirit, the promise. And when he comes upon you, you're going to receive power. It's the Greek word that's dunamis. It's the power to do the miraculous. And so when we pray, we're not praying as if we have nothing or that God has done nothing. We're going to ask him to do something. We have it now within us. Heard a story this week where a local business owner has been, uh, bought a business, been in business for a year. It's been struggling. It hasn't been doing well. The owner hasn't even taken a salary in a year. And uh, at a breaking point this week, opened up the mail and it was a utility bill that they didn't have the money to pay. Began to cry. And one of our, our, our folks here, one of our members, asked what's wrong. And the owner began to share what's going on that it's, it's, I don't know if we can make it, and I don't even have the money to pay this utility bill. So without, without hesitating, uh, the person said, well, let's pray. And so they did, right on the spot. And like one who's praying with authority, began to speak to it, declare it, believe God, and in Jesus' name, amen. And as soon as they said amen, the business owner goes, that's not how we pray in my church. <laughs> and uh, followed by, what is it that you all believe anyway? Because it was very abnormal. It seemed, it seemed arrogant. It seemed, who are you to speak that way? Well, in and of myself, I don't have authority, but I have the name of Jesus. I have been deputized, and I use it. And that's what this believer did. An hour and a half later, an individual came into the business and made, a, made an order. They thought, well, maybe this is the answer to prayer, but it was actually an order for the next month. 20 minutes later, mind you, this is a business, not a ministry. Someone walks in and says, I want to donate $50. So the owner said, you mean you want me to give it to somebody? Yeah, I want you to give it to this business, to which that covered the electric bill. The owner walked over to the believer that prayed for him and said, what is it that you know that I don't? <laughs> We're talking about living in resurrection power. So go with me back to John chapter 14. I'm going to start off with a verse that has some controversy, not because it needs to be controversial, but most uh, people create controversy. I think people have taken this verse in John 14 and uh, weakened it, thinned it out, tried to make it say something it's not. And I'll tell you my, my personal opinion as to why people uh, water this verse down is because it creates an excuse or a doctrine for why they don't see the power of God uh, in their lives. John 14, verse number 12, Jesus speaking. He says, the most assuredly I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than these he will do because I go to my Father. So I've had people say to me, wait a minute. Are you, try are you insinuating that we can do the same miraculous things as Jesus? No, I'm not insinuating anything. I'm flat out saying yes. That's exactly what I'm saying. I'm quoting the Bible. I believe that Jesus said it and I believe it's real. And so wait a minute. So let me get this right. You, you're saying that we can, we can do the same works that Jesus did and greater than our Lord? That's exactly what I'm saying because that's exactly what Jesus said. Now, I realize that steps on toes and some of you that are hearing that are going, yeah, this guy's out of, out of control. Well, let's, let's break this down a little bit. Twice, Jesus uses the word works. The first time, works, is the Greek word ergon. And it literally means or translates business, enterprise. It means a, a product or producing something, anything that's made with your hands. So go with me back to Luke chapter 2. When Jesus had been misplaced by his parents for about a day and a half, and they go back to the city looking for him, and they ask him, Jesus, what have you been doing? And what was his answer? Don't you know that I've been about my father's business? I've been doing the business of my father. So the second word in this verse, works, is greater works. It's the Greek word, megas. Guess what English word we get? Mega. Man, we understand mega. We understand supersize in America. We, we like everything bigger. The word there, mega or megas, it means greater in size. It means greater in measure and also greater in form. It means greater in degree, greater in intensity, and greater in quantity. Because Jesus is the conqueror, and if we're in Jesus, we are 
more than conquerors. We are mega. We're, and I'm not mixing words. We, Jesus said that we will do these works and greater. So living in a mundane, routine life, just making heaven, hiding out in our church services, just trying to make it, look at this big, bad, dark world as if we have nothing. We're missing out on the excitement, the Tiger Woods moments of this resurrection life. Amen? Amen. So the Christian life is difficult. The message is simple. The gospel is simple. But the life isn't easy. I mean, let's look at our examples. I mean, Jesus himself, they had plots out to murder him. He was lied about. He was ultimately tortured and crucified. The Apostle Paul, who wrote two-thirds of the letters in the New Testament, he was beaten with rods, he was stoned, he was imprisoned, and killed. The Christian life, we are going to face difficult things, difficult trials. And the life circumstances, life events are going to try to mount a case against you. And like in a court case that's being litigated, oftentimes people who are in a court case that's being litigated are given the opportunity to settle. Not because they're guilty or innocent, but they're given an opportunity to settle because the cost of litigating is so high. And so what we find is that Christians are settling. Christians are are taking the, the approach of stopping even, even trying. They've settled for something less than what God has promised them. I hate it, but I see it all the time. In my lifetime, in uh, the franchise of the Detroit Lions, the, the most infamous player, at least in my lifetime, is Barry Sanders. I mean, everyone here probably knows who Barry Sanders is, right? Do you know when Barry Sanders was up for the draft, the then head coach, Wayne Fonts, had to talk the owners into drafting him. Why? Because he was only 5'8", 202 pounds. So they talk him into it, and most of us know that Barry Sanders would go on to be the third uh, third in the line for the amount of yards rushed. 10 straight games or 14 straight games with over 100 yards. Uh, This guy was, was amazing. And what made Barry Sanders amazing at what he did he would get the ball, run to the line of scrimmage, and what would normally have crashed in on him for a two-yard loss, he would turn it into a 20-yard gain. Barry Sanders would run 80 yards to gain 20. And so you and I, when we come up against a wall, are we just going to lay down and quit and settle? Well, that was a good try. Are we going to take on that same approach? I'm going to still find a way to move forward, have forward progress in this resurrection life that's afforded to each one of us that believe. Uh, it's uh, Winston Churchill. He said, success is the ability to go from failure to failure and ha- not lose your enthusiasm. So the only way, and what I want to focus on today, the only way we're going to be able to do that, live that out, is to have some points of tools that will encourage us along the way. So, some things that will build us up. Jude chapter 1, verse 20 says, But you, beloved, building yourselves up in your most holy faith, Praying in the Holy Spirit. The word building there literally or specifically means building upon a foundation. To build up. As a Christian, as living out in this this resurrection power, we don't lay a new foundation. That's already been done. Ephesians 2.20 says that the prophets and the apostles already laid the foundation and Jesus holds the whole thing together as the chief cornerstone. So the foundation's there. You and I need some tools on how to build up our lives to last, to endure, to have forward progress even in the midst of difficult and trying situations so that when we're tempted to quit and we're tempted to settle, we'll remember these tools and we'll stay encouraged to live a life of victory. I'm going to talk about five things this morning, and I want to encourage you to write these down. Uh, There's a spot in your bulletin to take notes. Let me tell you what the five things are, and then we'll break them down. Five things that I believe are tools that will encourage us. Number one, prayer. Number two thing I want to look at is what we read. Third thing is what we listen to. The fourth thing is what we say. And the fifth thing is who we associate with. So let's start off with prayer. Prayer is our opportunity because of the access that we now have to the Father through Jesus that we have oneness, we have relationship with him. 1 Peter 5, 7 says that we need to cast our cares upon him because he cares. The word cast there means to heave, throw away, get it off from you. Do you know if you're feeling like you're weighted weighted down, bogged down, heavy, you're probably carrying a burden that you're not equipped to carry. And so when in prayer, we can get these things off. If, uh, if you think about it in a mechanical sense, 
Oil is doing a great job within your vehicle, right? It is keeping lubrication. It's keeping that engine from seizing up. But even over time, that oil will begin to get debris into it. And so it needs to be filtered. It needs to be able to purge itself of these things that will accumulate. As we go through life, if we're not careful, these things will cling. They'll hold on to us. And we'll start carrying it. It'll bog us down. We'll lose focus. We'll lose hope even. So we need to learn to cast our cares upon him because he cares. How awesome is that? That we have this opportunity to exchange our burdens. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 11, verse number 28. He says, come unto me, all you who, are, who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. A yoke is simply a piece of timber, a piece of board that connected two animals together, most often oxen. In the time that this was written and for hundreds of years after, farmers would connect two oxen together to either pull a wagon or, or plow a field. Well, one thing that maybe you don't know is that when a farmer would connect two oxen, he would have what would be called a lead oxen. It was a more mature one, stronger one. And he would yoke it to a younger that was less mature, less strong. The lead oxen would take the majority of the weight and pull the majority of the load. Along the way, that younger, more immature oxen learned how to keep pace. It learned how to respond and which direction to go. When you and I are yoked to Jesus, he's carrying the majority of the load, the workload. We learn how to keep pace with him. When he turns this way, we learn how to follow his direction. So we exchange these burdens. We yoke ourselves with him because he helps carry the weight through our lives. The third thing under prayer is tongues. The, the Holy Spirit gives us the gift of the Spirit, that we can pray in the Spirit. In Romans 8, 26, it says, Likewise, the Spirit also helps us, or helps in our weakness, for we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. There are times I don't know what to pray. I don't know what to say. So I thank God for the heavenly language. Anyone who's been baptized in the Holy Spirit, we have a gift of tongues that we can operate in. It's a powerful tool for each of us. The other part is authority. We as Christians operate from a place of victory, not for victory. When we have an obstacle in our way, Matthew 21, 21 says, we speak to our mountains. The obstacles, they've got to move. If there's a, a demonic oppression or some type of influence, which in my opinion is far less than we give credit to the enemy, he is defeated. But if there is, I'm not saying there isn't demonic influences, we have the power and authority over them too. They're defeated. Uh, Mark 16, 17 says that we cast out devils. I don't run from them. You don't have to run from them. We have authority. So staying encouraged, number one is prayer. The second one is what we read. What we read. Obviously, we need to be reading our Bibles. Many of you are students of the word. You study the scriptures. Uh, Romans 10, 17 says that faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. It doesn't say faith comes by hear what we've heard. So even if you're a normal uh, student, you're disciplined in reading, stay in it. There are times that we have a word from God that means something very specific for me right now. We, uh, we, get, we get educated by the word of God. We learn what the promises are. How can I stand confidently facing something if I don't even know what the promise is for me? It also teaches me Christian living and holiness. This is an important thing because if you have things going on in your life and things that are going bad, it, it could be a sin issue. Let me give you an example. Last winter, Carol had come uh, into the, was heading to the church and when she was driving down the road, the car was handling a little bit funny. And about halfway here, nine or ten miles later, the tire was flat from the start but completely disintegrated. And if she would have continued to drive, the wheel would have been destroyed and potentially she would have crashed and died. If she would have known that the tire was flat, she never would have drove on it. But just not knowing that it was flat, did that keep her from reaping the, the negative benefits of driving on a flat tire? No. We need to know what holiness looks like. We need to know what Christian living looks like so that we know for cooperating with the enemy. It could be literally an inviting door into our lives. So we study the word so we know how to live. We know how to cooperate in holiness. It gives us direction. I already said that it's not what we heard. It's what we're hearing. Psalms 119.105 says, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light unto my path. It does not say that it's a spotlight unto my future. It's a word that I need right now. 
I need direction right now. I need to make it a, a, a consciousness, a priority in my life to stay in my Bible if I'm going to live in a place of victory. When obstacles come, I'm going to find another way. I'm going to find a verse that's going to encourage me that I'm going to be like Barry Sanders and I'm going to move this way, but I'm going to get through and keep forward progress in this Christian life. I also would encourage you, if you have a dream, a hope, a desire, a call of God on your life, read some autobiographies. Read about people who've been there, who've done that. Uh, you know, one of the best methods of learning is finding out what someone else did wrong and then not repeating it. Why go through the pain uh, of what someone else went through? Let's learn from mistakes from others without having to experience the pain of those mistakes. But also, let's find out what worked for them. What did they do? What were the tools that they implied into their life or um, imposed into their normal uh, rituals that made them successful? There's also Christian living books that uh, we can get a hold of that people have good revelation, solid revelation on things that will encourage us and, we're, and prepare us for things. Speaking of prepared, I think that's one area that we, we really struggle with in Christian culture. We, we don't tend to live on the offense. We live on the defense. And, I, and I'll give you an example. I, I, as a pastor, I have people that come and see me or call me when they've been diagnosed with something negative in their body. I have people that will call me when they're in a financial situation, they're in trouble, uh, when their marriage is on the rocks. But now, if you're going to respond and try to get prepared once it's already happened, it's probably too late. We need to be in a preparation mode, planning so that when an attack comes on my health, I know how to respond. We don't send a, a, a soldier out to fight a war without first sending him through boot camp. We prepare them. So in every other area, we... I, bless God for the, I thank God for the Holy Spirit. But you know what? If, if I was going to go in and have brain surgery and the surgeon came into my room and said, uh, I asked him his credentials. Well, I, I don't have any. Uh, what school did you go to? I didn't go to school. I'm going to trust the Holy Spirit to, to cut your head open and, and do some brain surgery. How many would allow him to cut your head open and do some brain surgery? In every area we prepare before we do, let's learn to be prepared. I read a, a quote this week, Whitney Young says, it's better to be prepared for an opportunity and not have it than to have an opportunity not be prepared. That's a good one. We need to be prepared so that we live on the offense, not on the defense. Amen. Number three, what we listen to. So prayer, what we read, what we listen to. Coming to church is an awesome privilege that we have, that we can hear encouraging words. We can, we can come, leave this place with some application. Andy Stanley said one time that the whole Bible from cover to cover is full of truth, but without application, it doesn't seem relevant to the person. So we as pastors need to give handles to that truth so that you can leave this place with something that I can apply to my life. Otherwise, it's just going to seem irrelevant, even though it's truth. So we come and we get inspired, we get encouraged. We, we also need to, um, to listen for adjustments, listen for correction, listen for things that, that are, are going to help our lives. Proverbs 19.20 says, listen to counsel and receive instruction that you may be wise in your latter days. The New Living Translation says that, that you might be wise in your future. Again, going back to preparation. But when we get adjustments, if we get corrections, and, and even if we get rebukes, if you have a hope, an expected end, you, you have a destination, you, you're wanting to go somewhere. Let me give you an example in my own life. I'm personally convicted about maintaining a healthy lifestyle. I want to be a dad and a husband for as long as I possibly can. I want to preach the gospel for as long as I possibly can. I want to keep my body in a position of healthy, healthiness so that I can do it. I don't want my body to fail on me. Well, I noticed I wasn't getting some results that I, want, I wanted. And so I looked into some things. I was eating some things that were sabotaging my results. And so I, I recognized it. I saw it. I made an adjustment. And all of a sudden... I started getting the results I wanted. I started feeling better again. If you're at church today and you're, you're facing something, you have an expected end of hope, and I bring an adjustment or a correction or even a rebuke, don't be offended by that. Make the adjustment so, praise God, I can get where I'm going. We need to have that, uh, that voice in our lives that's helping us. Proverbs 15, verse number 31 says, The ear that hears the rebukes of life will abide among the wise. 
He who disdains instruction despises his own soul, but he who heeds rebukes gets understanding. The fear of the Lord is the instruction of wisdom, and before honor is humility. We got to be humble. We got to listen. We need to listen to people that have fruit in their life. Don't listen to the fruits in your life. Listen to the people with fruit in their life. And I'm not talking about the fruit they say they used to have. I'm not talking about the fruit that they say they're going to have. The fruit they have in their life right now. That the word of God is proven in their life. You know, it's very difficult to receive counsel, advice, or correction from somebody who's not living that proven word in their life. So when you, uh, when you come across somebody who has the word of God proven in their life, we need to listen up to that speaker or that minister. An individual that's helped me a great deal is Andrew Womack. Andrew Womack Ministries has helped me a great deal in my life and in my ministry. One of the things that uh, people struggle with him is he's very forward. He can be darn right insulting. But what I love about it is that he has the fruit of what he's saying in his life. So I can get past the ouchy words to get the results I'm looking for. I have an expected end. I don't want to stay the same. I want to grow. I want to mature. I want to see this area advance. I want to see the kingdom of God advance in this area. I want to, I want to think bigger. I want to walk in a, in a power that I know is available to me. So I listen up when people have the word of God proven in their life. The fourth thing is what we say. What we say. This is literally life and death. What we say. Proverbs 18 verse 20 says, a man's stomach shall be satisfied from the fruit of his mouth. From the produce of his lips he shall be filled. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. In other words, you will eat your words. Because this resurrection power is within us, we are just like our Heavenly Father, who, by the way, created the universe with his words. When you and I speak, we have power. We need to be careful what we're saying. And I know that some people get in a ditch where, well, you shouldn't say that. You know, like someone says, man, this headache's killing me. I think that's a really unwise thing to say. And I realize that some people say, well, that's not what I meant. But I'll tell you, personally, I'd much rather you favor that ditch than over here and just let your words fly everywhere like they don't mean anything. What we say really makes a difference. Proverbs 21, 23 Whoever guards his mouth and tongue keeps his soul from troubles. What we speak to lives. What we speak to multiplies. Jesus on the cross said very few words because he knew and understood that if he continued to speak, he would live. The assignment was for him to die. Whenever you're speaking to is going to live and multiply. And also when you speak, what you say is not just to the people that are listening to you. Guess what? We have ears too. So I'm hearing what I'm saying. What I'm saying will begin to deposit seeds within my subconscious and I will, it'll determine what I believe. It'll change all of a sudden uh, things that uh, a stressful event comes up and something will fly out of my mouth and we'll say something to the effect of, where did that come from? I'll tell you where that came from. It came from what you've been reading, what you've been listening to. It came from what you've been saying. You're actually believing what you're saying. So when you speak the right things, you get to hear the benefit of the right words as well. We're talking about encouragement. I want us to live out this Christian life, the resurrection power, when we face troubles, and we will. What we say makes a difference. The last one is who we surround ourselves with. Who we surround ourselves with. Connect to people that you can learn from. If you're the smartest one in your group, look for another group. <laughs> and I don't mean abandon the group, by the way. You don't, you don't need to leave. But you need to start associating with people that have done something that you're looking to do. Someone that you respect, that you can learn from. Hang out with people that dream big, that make you feel like your dream is small. That will stretch your way of thinking. You need to connect with people who are searching to know God better. If you're connecting with someone, and I mean intimately with someone who's not even walking with God or walking towards God, you're having to fight with someone who's going the wrong direction, right? I mean, you're trying to go this way and you're connected to this person and you can't go. So when I say who we connect to, let me, let me make sure that we all understand. As Christians, we aren't supposed to just go hang out with Christians. We're supposed to go into the world. But there's two types of Christians, the influencer or the influencee. 
Which one are you? Are you going into the world to share the, the light of the gospel, to share the good news? Or is the, is the people that you're connecting to being the influencer on you? In uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 33, it says, Do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. So the word company there is not just someone that you know as an acquaintance. It's actually a very intimate word. It means companionship. It, it also means intercourse. And it means communion. These are people that are close to you like a husband and a wife. These are people that are your dear friends, that you, they know you, you know them. There's a relationship. So when you connect to someone at that level and, and they're not walking with God, it says that the evil company corrupts. That word corrupts in the Greek language means to destroy. It'll disintegrate. It will deteriorate what your, your habits are. The word habit there is the Greek word for character. And so if you connect yourself intimately with people that aren't even walking in the right direction, they will begin to influence you in a negative way. Let me, let me wrap up with this. Uh, I shared last week my, my uh, love for fishing. And you would think, by the way, I talk that I'm in rivers and creeks and lakes all the time. I, I'm not. I, I want to be. And I'd love to be more, but I'm not. But one of the things that I began to settle in my heart last year, last season, was I want to, I want to catch a smallmouth bass big enough to mount and hang on my wall in my office. And I have to hang it in my office because my wife won't let me hang it at home. So I'm, I'm, in my mind, I'm seeing my office like a taxidermy. It might offend some of you, but I'm going to have all kinds of critters on the wall. But I want to catch a smallie big enough to mount, put on the wall. So last year, one of my last outings, I went thinking, you know what? This is going to be the trip. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to catch one, bring it back, and I'm going to have this one mounted. So I get in the water. Within my first few casts, I start catching some rock, some rock bass, one after the other. And uh, I mean, there's nothing wrong with rock bass, but it's not what I was after. I mean, rock bass are good eating. And if you don't know what a rock bass is, they're basically just a pudgy bluegill, right? But they're not mountable. You never walk into someone's office or house and say, hey man, check out my rock bass on the wall, right? But the rock bass was encouraging me that the fish are biting. Here's the key. Don't settle for something that's only intended to encourage you. Don't stop short. We need to that, allow that encouragement to be that. That's what encouragement does. It keeps us from settling. But don't settle for something that was given by God to encourage you. I needed something that's mountable. So why, why do I want to mount a big old small mouth on my wall? I'll tell you why. I want something to point at. I'm not going to lie. I want to be able to point at that big fish and then you know I'm telling the truth. And it's not just some fish story. Would you stand with me? We pray that you were blessed by this message. If you are curious about our ministry or would like to talk to someone, you can contact us through our website, believerschristianchurch.com.